Dr. Frank Morgan. And I, I know the vast majority of you guys, and I'm just honored that you guys would show up to hear me kind of drone on and talk about sugar. But this is actually the, the, the subject that is, is most important to me because every single day I spend the vast majority of my time treating people's problems that are literally a fallout of excessive sugar consumption. So the title of this lecture is Sugar, It Ain't So Sweet. My daughter actually made up the title of it, but it's, I thought this is great. This is great. We're going to go with it. Um, so uh, the first thing I would like to do is just, uh, just talk a little bit uh, in general about sugar, sugar consumption, and the history of, sh of, of, uh, of sugar. Now, I don't know if you are aware of this or if you've ever considered this, but I want to uh, I want to assert this today to you, and hopefully by the end of this conversation you'll agree with me that sugar is not actually meant as human food. It's we're not supposed to eat it. In fact, you may not know this, but people didn't actually even eat sugar until about 2,000 years ago when they discovered it. And the way it happened is in India, where sugar cane would grow up naturally, they noticed that if it would fall over and they they, they and it would crack, this juice would run out, and they knew that was sweet because they would chew it. But if the juice ran out and it dried in the sun, it would make a little white residue. They could scrape it up and collect it, and there they had it. They would have have some sugar. What they would do is they would gather up the sugar and then they would say, this is amazing stuff. It tastes great. And mind you, this was 2,000 years ago. But did you know they didn't eat it? There's historical accounts. They actually used it for money. It turned out to be a bartering instrument. And there are literal historical accounts of men buying wives with barrels of sugar. <laughs> and I always joke around and say, this is why we call our wives sugar, right? So what's that? Oh, that's me. Oh, well, that's, I, mean, I stand corrected. The reason we call our wives sugar is because they're sweet. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's true. So um, it, it turned out that people wouldn't eat their money. It's like you wouldn't eat a, a $50 bill, and that's a little like what was going on with the sugar, and it would sort of work its way up the food chain, if you will, to people who could afford to eat it. And literally, it was only the kings back in those days in India that could eat the sugar. Long about uh, in the 1200s, and I'm going to put a timeline up here just to kind of keep us oriented here. In about 1200, there was an explorer that went from Europe to the Orient, which included India and some of that area, and he do you all know who it, who it was? Marco Polo. Marco Polo, that's right. And he brought back three main things to the kings of Europe that they went crazy over, and it was silk, spices, and sugar. But these things were enormously expensive. In order to get them from the Orient, they had to go, the, the process was ships would sail down around Spain, up through the Mediterranean, where they would dock somewhere, maybe in along where it was Lebanon or, or where Israel is, and then they would they would travel in in, in caravans with camels, and uh, goods would trade hands of different merchants as it went across deserts where there were bandits. By, by the way, there were pirates in the Mediterranean, and by the time they got the, got there, got back with the sugar, it, it was so enormously expensive that only literally only the kings could have even a little bit. It was, it was just cost prohibitive. In about 1492, there was another interesting thing that happened. We all know that's the year that Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And the reason why he did it was not what we think. I mean, you know, you kind of have this mindset. You go through school and you know, oh, he's, he's like exploring the world. That's not what was going on there. What was going on is he, he made a deal with the, the king and queen of Spain to where he would get in his ship and go try to find a better route to India. That was the whole point. He wanted to do that. And why? To make money. It was all about the almighty buck. The reason why he set sail and turned west from the, the latitude where India was on is because he figured the earth was round and he thought if he goes west and he sails long enough, he's going to hit India. He got to some islands. He named them the West Indies. He named the natives Indians. But he wasn't in India, and there was no sugar cane. So he went back, he reported to the king and queen of Spain, I found India, I found Indians, but there was no sugar cane. And you know what happened? He, he got sent back, and he made a second voyage, and he took sugar cane seedlings with him. Now, this is just a, a fact of history most people don't know. Columbus took sugar cane seedlings 
from Europe, and he took them to the Caribbean, and he planted them. And he did it so that he could open up a new trade routes where they could get cheaper sugar. Well, what ended up happening is Spain began to enslave the locals there on the Caribbean islands, but it turns out the locals didn't make very good slaves. They also were highly vulnerable to smallpox and some of the European diseases, so they began to die off, and they were, they were scrambling for um, slaves. So what ended up happening is, the, and historians call this era, it, it, ter- it was a terrible era, and it was called the Triangle of Death, where traders would sail from Europe, uh, from Europe in- England, France, and Spain, with, with money and goods. They would go down to Africa, on the, the west coast of Africa, and they would trade those goods for slaves, load them in the ships, sail across the Atlantic, offload them for sugar. They would take the sugar products back to Europe, trade it for more gold, go back down to Africa, and on it goes over and over again for a couple of hundred years till... Let's see here, 1492, we had Columbus. By 1500, let's just pause for a second and say, how much sugar could the average European eat in 1500? Zero. There was no sugar, really, except for the kings. By 1700s and 200 years, which is an awful long time, by 1700, the average European or American colonist could eat around two pounds of sugar a year. And it was just because they had exploited slavery. There were sugar plantations in places like Haiti, Puerto Rico, and um, we could eat about two pounds a year. In 1765, the British crown passed the first tax on the American colonists. It was the first one. It was to help pay for the French and Indian War, and that tax was on sugar. And uh, just, oh, just over 10 years Later, we had the Revolutionary War, so we may have uh, we may have the sugar to thank for the United States of America in part. Uh, by 1800, sugar plantations had begun to grow and evolved so that the average American colonist or European was now eating five pounds of sugar a year. And we're just going to keep building this up and make and point out some things. Uh, by 1900, uh, slavery had. Uh, largely ended. The Civil War had happened. The Europeans had banned slavery. Slavery was even ended in the Caribbean, uh, but they began to uh, invent machines. But So the sugar uh, production pretty much doubled uh, in this 100 years. It went up by two, uh, 250% um, in the, from 1700 to 1800. By 1930 or so, the average sugar consumption was around 20 pounds. And um, I just saw an interesting video clip uh, just this week, and it, it just showed up on a, like an Instagram feed or a YouTube short video, and it was Street Scenes 1930. And you could easily look this up. If you just go to YouTube, you can type in Street Scenes New York City 1930. And it is utterly fascinating. There's two things that stand out. What, what is it? Skinny people. That's one. Does anybody know the other thing? They're all dressed really nice, and that has nothing to do with this talk, but they're just fabulously dressed, and, and they don't look like we look nowadays. But they look great, and they're, 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 there's just no evidence of obesity in 1930 that, that I could find. So by 1940, the average person was still eating around uh, 20 pounds or so a year, but there's a thing that happened, and I always like to share this because it's a little bit personal, they rationed sugar. Sugar was still such a valuable commodity that they needed it to send to the troops during World War II, so they pretty much told anybody, everybody, pump the brakes on sugar, and to keep you from doing that, we're going to ration it. So I was, I, t- I was talking to my grandmother about this uh, about 10 years ago. It was right before she passed away, and she her eyes got bright, and she says, oh, I still have my ration stamps. And I said, what? And she goes, I still have my ration. So I said, well, I have to see them. So she went, and she got this cardboard box, and it was full of just yellowed letters and, and old things. And she pulled out these stamps. It was a stamp book. Look, you could open it up. You could tear the stamp out. And you'd have to take the, the stamps with your money to the grocer to buy sugar and other goods. So I said, oh. Please, can I please have your stamps? And she goes, oh, sure, you can have them. So I'm going to pass these around. These are war ration stamps from 1943. 
And uh, I, my, my grandmother and her family, they had a lot more stamps than they had money because they came out of the, the, just the, the Dust Bowl of the Panhandle of Texas. But it's just an interesting relic of history to look at that they actually rationed sugar. I mean, that's almost unfathomable in our day. By 1960, average sugar com consumption is guessed to be around 30 pounds a year. And these are just guesses that I've been able to find looking at historical documents and internet articles. Um, the average woman graduating high school at age 18 years old weighed, how much this guess? How much do you think a woman? 110 here and 110. The average, I'll just put it into context. Right now, the average woman, 18 years old, graduating high school today is about 140 to 145. That's what we see. And girls aren't taller nowadays than they were in 1960. They're taller than maybe they were in, in 1800, but not 1960. And they're, they're really not more muscular. They're, they're just heavier. And they, the average woman in 1960 graduating high school weighed 105 pounds. The average man weighed 140 pounds. And the average man now weighs about 175 to 180. And it's evident. We can just see that. That's actually what we see and, and what you'll see in your, your kids. So we've, we've put on an extra 40 pounds or so since 1960. And it's not muscle. And we're not taller. <laughs> so I'm going to let you fill in the blanks and we'll figure out what happened here. So in 1970, right, so it's, it's the hormones, right, in the chicken? So in 1970, there was a, a scientist, he was a Japanese scientist, and he invented a fabulous thing. So they thought. He invented a way to make sugar, or what is sort of sugar for us, out of corn. Now, until then, it was harvested from sugar cane, which was in short supply. And around here, we even know of sugar beets. If you're old enough, you'll go, yeah, that's about when the sugar beet industry in Greeley really tanked. It's because they could make sugar out of corn, and corn is plentiful. So uh, 1970, they invented what's called high, is high fructose corn syrup. And I'm going to show you what that is as, this, uh, as we go on. 1975, by the way, I was born in 1970. A lot of people, if you're born after me, you were born into the generation where we have abundant and plentiful sugar. 1975, the United States approved for consumption high fructose corn syrup. And if you were alive, and, you were, and a lot of people were in the 1980s, you will remember we had a, an explosion of sugared beverages. We had high C. Remember the high C commercial where the, the pitcher would come out and bust through and the kids would get it, all the Kool-Aid, and then you could add the sugar to the Kool-Aid. And then they had the non-sugar Kool-Aid that your mom added the sugar to. And then they got Capri Sun and Sunny Delight. Now there's grocery store aisles are just filled with sugared beverages. But that, it's, it's, it's not the only place. And we're going to get to that uh, as, as we move on. Do you remember the Pepsi challenge? Where two to one people preferred the taste of Pepsi over Coke. And if you were at the Greeley Stampede, you would go and you'd stop at the booth so you could get some free pop, and then you'd taste it and say, yeah, I prefer the taste of Pepsi over Coke, and you were one of the statistics. Because they would have that set up at places like the Stampede. Well, Coke said, we can't do this. They're, they're beating us. They're, be they're, they're beating us two to one. It, they did it because Pepsi had more sugar. So Coke did something. Remember what they did? They changed the recipe, and we had new Coke. Do you remember that? We, until I reminded you, we forgot it. There was new Coke. Because new Coke became Coke, and it just had more sugar in it. And at first, there was pushback. But they did their research. Those guys knew what they were doing. New Coke caught up again. I mean, new Coke is just what Coke is. It's crazy. So that was what we experienced. And do you remember, do you remember refills on Pops? We used to have to pay for that. I remember when I was 12 years old, I have this recollection, in it, and I remember because I was embarrassed. I was, you know, everything's embarrassing when you're in junior high. So I, I was at a Whataburger in Texas, and I went up to the counter to get, with my quarter to get another pop. So I laid it down on the counter and said, I would like another pop, or I'd like a refill of my pop. And he, the guy behind the counter, he was incredulous. He looked at me and he goes, if you want he goes, kid, if you want another pop, you got to buy a whole nother pop. And so I just was, just slunk down. It was embarrassing. All I had was a quarter, and I couldn't buy a whole nother pop, so I didn't have it. Well, eventually, pop refills got free, 
And then the guys behind the counter got sick and tired of doing free refills. So they took the fountain machine and they took it out there and said, knock yourself out. They gave you the cup. And then the cups got larger. We had the big gulp. And the next thing you know, pop, we've got just a pop. It's crazy how much pop. High fructose current corn syrup became, they started adding it in on the grocery store food. In fact, when, when next time you buy bread and you look at the ingredients of bread, in virtually any bread you can find, when you look at the ingredients on the back, the second ingredient, and you know, they list the ingredients in the order that the ingredients appear. So it's flowers the most in bread, right? The second one is almost always. And I, I dare say always, but it's not exactly true because some people make healthier bread. But it's almost always high fructose corn syrup, cheap sugar. Why? Well, it tastes better. A few years ago, I remember uh, my kids were at, at Dayspring and at, the, at, this, at the, this school over here, and they were doing a fundraiser. And the fundraiser was, we get paid $100 per family that comes and tastes bread it was a way, do you, does anybody remember that? Okay, so what the, there was a, some bread manufacturing, some bread company. They had a bunch of recipes for bread, and they were doing some, a market analysis to figure out which bread people liked the best. So they brought a bunch of families in with kids and grown-ups, and so we walked over there, and he was like, sure, we'll participate so that Dayspring can make some money, and we eat, would eat bread, and then, well, there was some bread that was clearly <laughs> tasted better. It tasted sweeter. It was better because it was sweeter and that we like sweet. Right? In fact, we like sweet so much that, that it will drive us, and we'll talk about some of the reasons why that happens uh, as we progress through the history of this and get into the biochemistry of it. But It's an example of how grocers begin to add sugar to food. Oh, by the way, sugar's a preservative also in the food. It acts as a preservative. It doesn't just make it taste sweeter. It increases the shelf life. Do you remember as a kid growing up, bread would mold? When's the last time you threw out moldy bread? It doesn't happen anymore because it's got so much sugar in it, even the bacteria or the fungus will say, no, no thanks. Not, that's not, we're, we're not having that. So that was 1975 when it was approved for human consumption. So we're going to fast forward to the year 2020 and we're going to play a little guessing game. Venture a guess. This is what Sugar consumption was historically. And remember, for millennia, <coughs> mankind didn't even eat sugar. And then it started picking up. What do you think in the United States the average annual sugar consumption is in the United States? Anybody want to venture a guess? 50. 50. We got 50. We got 100. We got, yeah. yeah. It's shocking. The last stat I heard was from 2020. It was, and this deserves to be put in red. 140 pounds of sugar a year. And this is a food that we really shouldn't eat, and I'm getting ready to show you why. So as we talk about sugar, I'm just going to put this up just to help us remember it. As we talk about sugar, it always brings up the question, well, what is sugar anyway? You know, we've got blood sugar, and that's the stuff when you come to the doctor, we measure the lab, or if you've got diabetes and we're monitoring your sugar, we're measuring blood sugar. And you go, if we've got sugar in our blood, how can sugar be bad for us? It turns out that a blood sugar is not the same thing as table sugar. What blood sugar is, it's, a, it's something called glucose. All right, so I'm going to show you kind of an abbreviated version of it. I just don't want this to get too complex. If we were to draw this from a biochemical standpoint, I'm going to draw like this. We're going to put an oxygen. We're going to hook it to some carbons like that. All right, I'm going to make it kind of a ringed molecule. There's stuff hanging off the carbons. Forget about that stuff right now. We're going to say it's a ringed molecule. And when we eat this stuff, it's as if we were made to eat this stuff. It's a perfect fuel for our bodies. Our body can use it readily, and it doesn't seem to be bad for us. Uh, and we can burn it readily for fuel. So that's primarily what we do with it. And we'll burn it right away, and we'll burn it first thing. It's the first fuel we'll burn when we need fuel for our bodies. If we eat too much of it, we turn it into something that we can burn for fuel later. Guess what that is? Yeah. Everybody says that. It's a trick question. <laughs> I got you. But it's, <laughs> it's not fat. We turn it into glycogen. All right? So what? What? it's called glycogen. I'll show you what it is. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to redraw this, but I'm going to draw it abbreviated. Now, it's just that. That is one of those. Okay? So what glycogen is, it's a whole bunch of those clumped together. 
like that. And we store it in the presence of some water, and we can use it really easily. So when we're needing fuel, we'll turn run it down this fuel pathway and we'll burn it later. Now, where do we store glycogen? There's two places ma mainly that we store it. The main place we store it by far is in our liver. That's the number one place we store glycogen. The second place we can store it is in our muscles. And scientists think that we can store about 1,500 calories worth of glycogen at any one time. And that's about how many calories most of us would burn if we didn't have food for 24 hours and we did nothing but we were laying around. And in about a day, you would exhaust all of your glycogen storages in your liver, and then you would start, ha you'd start burning some other form of fuel, usually fat. Now, we can and we do convert some of the glucose we eat into fat, but, but it's not that much. Uh, scientists think that we convert about 0.5%, half of 1% we convert to fat. And when we get hungry and we're running low on glycogen, that's when we start burning fat for fuel. And we can run that down the fuel pathway and everything is fine. And you might look at that and say, well, doctor, what, what's wrong with that? And the answer is nothing, really. It's how we're supposed to eat. And you may go, well, where does this come from and what are we talking about here anyway? Well, let me, let me just go on just a little bit more. I want to explain something. I want to explain why we get glucose to go into our liver, how that's done metabolically and hormonally. What, what happens is, is there's a very important hormone that when glucose is high in our blood, our pancreas will secrete and it will cause us to store the sugar in, the, in our liver in the form of glycogen. Does anybody know what that hormone is? Yes, it's insulin. Great. So uh, we're going to draw that. It's so important, but I'm going to draw it in red. So insulin is what drives sugar that way. Does that make sense? Okay, super important. Now, in, so insulin is a hormone that has a specific signal. Every, hormones are chemical messengers. The message of insulin is store. Don't forget that, store, because we're gonna come back to it. All right, so where, do, where does glucose come from in our diet? Well, the re, let me back up. The reason we have to store glucose in clumps like that is because our Living tissue doesn't like a high concentration of it when it looks like that. That's how come diabetes hurts people. If their blood sugar gets too high, the living tissue, namely the small vessels in their body, their, in their kidney and in their eyes and in their nerves, the smallest blood vessels, they start taking damage because of the excessive glucose concentrations. So we wouldn't want to store it in an excessive concentration, but when you clump it together, it, it doesn't do that. It's because the reason it does it, technically, just in case you're wondering, it's because it exerts an osmotic effect, which is a fluid pressure across cell membranes, and it can hurt the cell membranes. In any case, we, we have to store it as a clump, but plants are the same way. But plants don't store glucose as a clump, plants that make glucose store the glucose as a chain. So the way it works is if we eat this stuff, here's some more glucose molecules, and they're, they're in chains, and sometimes these chains will branch like that. And that, that's not so important that they branch, but that stuff, long chains of glucose stuck together, we call that starch. All right, so that's starch, and there's examples of starchy food and stuff that'll make sense to you. Really, it comes from two main sources, although there's carbs in a lot of different plants, but the main sources of our carbohydrates in our diet are grains, which are corn, wheat, rice, oats, and taters, potatoes, taters, I'm calling them taters. Grains and taters is what we're talking about here that cause that, um, that are starchy food. So when we eat this stuff, does it taste sweet? Like if I get a potato and eat it, it's, it's not that sweet, does it? So this stuff isn't that sweet. And when we, then what happens is when we eat it, we break the chain link between those molecules. That is what is happening when we digest our food. So digestion is the breaking down of food. So now we got, we turn these chain links into glucose and then we can burn it for fuel or store it or convert a little, to, little fat. Now this is normal. This is all normal and ought not to make us fat and it didn't in 1930, because that's how people ate. 
And a lot of people go, well, yeah, well, they were, um, they, they, they were exercising more. Did you know they've actually done studies and they weren't? They didn't exercise more. We probably exercise more now. Pe people didn't do purposeful exercise. I mean, that, that's a modern construct to go exercise. People just didn't do that. that, that they, they, they did work hard, but not all of them. Some of them were secretaries and had desk jobs. And the street scene in New York City is a bunch of businessmen wearing suits. They weren't out in the field pushing a plow behind a horse in the 1800s. They were just sitting at a desk, and they were still skinny. Why? Yeah, we're going to get to it. So, so it turns out that when we talk about table sugar, it's, it's, it's not, that's not a complete story. It's not that. Glucose is not table sugar. What table sugar is, is something different. It's a, actually what's called a disaccharide. It's got two sugar molecules hooked together, and one of them is glucose. That's why I explained it to you. The other one is, it looks like this. So if I'm going to draw this, I'm going to draw him over here, and he's got an oxygen on him, and a carbon, and another carbon, and another carbon, and another carbon, so that's him, and his name is fructose. All right, can you guys see the difference between glucose and fructose? It's one carbon. This one's got one, two, three, four, five carbons. This one's got one, two, three, four. Now, it turns out that fructose is about two times sweeter than glucose. What the fellow did who figured out how to make high fructose corn syrup did, is he figured out he could take a grain, namely corn, take the starch, break it down into the glucose, and then through a chemical reaction, change more than half of it, usually it's about 55%, into fructose. Now when we eat table sugar, it's 50-50, but high fructose corn syrup is 55-45, and and so it's to some degree worse than table sugar. We'll get to what, what the problem with fructose is here in a moment. But it's twice as sweet. In fact, you have most likely in your house a bottle of straight up glucose. And you have table sugar, so you can do this experiment. Your bottle of straight up glucose is called light k syrup. And most likely you have some in your house. If you take a little bit of light k syrup, put it on a spoon or taste it, you'll go, yeah, that's kind of sweet. And then if you take some sugar behind it and taste it, you'll go, yep, that's definitely sweeter. So that's the fructose. Because what happens is when we put this in our mouth, we have enzymes in our saliva that will break that bond and we'll get some free glucose and free fructose. So we'll taste the sweeter part of the fructose. Now, what's the problem with fructose? Turns out we can't as readily burn it for fuel. We have to change it into something that we can burn for fuel later. Guess what that is? No, nobody's guessing. <laughs> I already gave you one trick question. I uh, that's what happens. So, yeah, you, so anybody want to say it? Fat. fat. Yeah, that's right. We turn fructose into fat. Not all of it, but a great deal of it gets turned into fat. Scientists think that it gets converted to fat at a rate of about 30%. Now just take a look here. That is, that, that number 30%, compare that to this, is half of 1%. That is 60 times faster, the fat conversion rate, as glucose. All right? And where, does anybody know, anybody want to guess where that happens? Like what organ in our body would you think would do that? Who said that? Good guess, it's our liver. So that happens in our liver. So here we are, we're eating fructose. It goes through our gut, goes through our liver. We're making fat in our liver. Now, what is supposed to be in our liver? Glycogen. But now we're overloading it with fat. So I'm going to put some fat globules in our liver. And I want to explain what happens when we do that. Okay. Now we eat some glucose. We eat a, a baked potato. And we have the glucose, it gets broke down, it comes over, we make insulin, but our liver is full of fat now. And by the way, this is a cumulative effect, and it begins to happen slowly, and it will stick around after many decades of eating fat. So what we're seeing now is people in their 40s and their 50s, sometimes earlier, depending on how they've been eating, because of the excessive fructose consumption, they have what we call fatty liver disease. And fatty liver disease is, is, is always present in a diabetic. 
They always have it because it is the underlying cause. Here's how it happens. We got fat in our liver. We eat this baked potato, and we're trying to push glycogen in our liver, but our liver is full already. It's full of fat, and fat is very energy dense. It's so full of energy. So here's our liver. It's just filled with, filled with fat, and it's looking at food coming. It's going, oh, no, not again. And it goes, <laughs> no, we're not storing more. So insulin is saying, no, store. And, and then our liver says, no, we're not storing. So our pancreas is seeing the blood sugar go up, and then our pancreas doesn't like that, and it goes, I said store the sugar. And what does that mean? Insulin levels are increased. So in a pre-diabetic person, when we do labs, we'll see these high insulin levels in a fasting state. Why would we see high insulin levels in a fasting state? Because their body is requiring high insulin levels just to maintain a normal sugar. And the pancreas is shouting it. Over time, the pancreas gets tuckered out and just can't do it anymore. It's been making all this insulin now for the past 10 years. Now we got lower insulin levels in the face of insulin <coughs> resistance. What do you call that? Type 2 diabetes. That's right. And then we got problems. Once that happens, oh man. And we can, we can manage it. We work hard. It's when you really have to start getting really, really tough on the diet when that happens. So we are supposed to store our fat. I mean... Let me back up. So as we store fat in our liver, this ends up creating insulin resistance. But there's a, another problem. Insulin being high, now that we have insulin resistance, tells our brain something. Guess what it tells our brain? It's a storage hormone. It tells your brain, store. Now, and you might wonder, you know, that's so weird. Why would insulin that goes high after I have a meal tell my brain to store? And you need to think back to sort of the natural history of mankind. The natural history of mankind is they didn't live like we live. We live in this, we live in a world of constant, ever-present feasting. The only thing that keeps you from eating way more than you need to eat is your good sense because it's not a lack of food, right? And so we always have it available. We can eat all we want whenever we want. There's a fast food joint on every corner. Shoot, you could eat something on the way home if you wanted to. So in a world, though, where we, if we were going through feasting during harvest and fasting during winter, and then we'd have feasting and fasting, then our hormones would be working different. So insulin is the feasting hormone, and so it tends to get higher and higher. So it tells your brain, hey, food is plentiful, eat. And by the way, as a side note, there are certain things that can trigger your body to make more insulin level and make you hungry. And they are seeing food. Like if you've got food on your, interest, or your Instagram feed or your Pinterest feed and you're looking at recipes and it's on your Facebook and you're watching the commercials on TV, you'll be hungry. And one of the mechanisms by which that will create hunger in you is insulin. Smelling food is another thing. If you smell food, and this is a, this is the thing. Seeing food, smelling food, even thinking of food can cause your body to make insulin. And, then, and By the way, I, I, I want to really emphasize something. Hormones are so powerful. It is almost impossible to overcome a hormonal drive to do anything, but particularly to eat when food is plentiful. So, in developing tactics to lose weight, one thing that we must do is figure out a tactic that's going to either get rid of insulin resistance so that we can get this down, or just keep and to keep a lid on this. This is where things like intermittent fasting and low-carb diets can kind of come in and help is because behind the scenes what they're doing is they're trying to trick us into having lower insulin levels. There's another hormone called glucagon, often referred to as GLP-1, and we can, make, we can get more of that through intermittent fasting, and we can get it if we eat a, high, a lot of fiber, but that think of that as your famine hormone. If you were stuck on a, on a ship at sea, for example, and uh, you hadn't had anything to eat for two weeks, this is Todd, we found Todd, Todd, you haven't had anything, here, come on, let me, I, I, here, eat this cheeseburger. Todd would go, oh, not so much, I'm, I'm stuffed. I, I'm, in, I'm, I'm not hungry at all. He wouldn't say I'm stuffed. He'd say, just give me some water. I haven't had anything to, anyway, that's what happens literally to people who, go for prolonged periods of time out of their control without eating, it's hard to get him to eat again. And it's what happens like with anorexia. It's one of the hormonal drives behind it. There's more, and that's more complex, but there's more going on here. 
Remember I told you that this fat happens in the liver? All right. So when our liver gets full, it's, it actually, it's trying to kick that out, and it will spill and push that fat out into our blood. And, and I, I'm going to abbreviate this, but what it does is it kicks fat into our blood by means of a, a fat particle that we call your triglycerides. This is what's typically measured on a lipid panel when you get that back. And, but there's a, there's a complex interplay between your triglyceride level and the size of your low-density lipoproteins. So the LDL, it's often referred to as bad cholesterol. Did you know it's actually not cholesterol? It just carries cholesterol. So LDL carries cholesterol, and it, it's, it actually forms when a larger part particle called a, a lipoprotein or a chylomicron exits your liver, and, and after it drops off fatty cargo, which includes cholesterol and triglycerides, it will shrink down to an LDL where it sits in your blood and waits to go back to your liver to get recycled to be a cargo carrier ship to carry fatty stuff to your blood. That, that's what's going on. But it turns out that if you start out with an awful lot of triglycerides in those LDLs, then when they get depleted of their contents, they will be really small. And it turns out that the really small LDLs cause, that's what causes heart attacks and strokes. So the other thing that fructose is doing is it's increasing the risk for having cardiovascular disease. And what are we seeing since the 1970s? An epidemic of obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. But there's more. Did you know that fructose also blocks your brain's ability by itself to feel full? Now, they've done multiple experiments with this, even with intravenous fructose and, and, and brain imaging, where they do PET scan imaging of a brain, and they find that it blocks the area in your brain that you need to be feeling satiety and fullness. They've done experiments with kids in a, you know, where they feed them a hamburger and fries and a soda, or they feed them hamburger and fries and water, and they'll actually eat more of the hamburger and fries if they're drinking the soda. So fructose by itself is blocking hunger. It's causing more insulin, which is making hunger, but it's worse. There's even more that fructose does for you. It turns out that fructose can also cause cognitive impairment. It can impair memory and learning. So in our kids, if they're getting loaded up with sugared foods before school, and what, and what are most breakfast foods? It's Pop-Tarts and it's, it's, it's cereal. breakfast cereal. Yeah, I forgot all these because I never eat them, right? No, just kidding. Uh, think of it like, like granola and yogurt. That sounds like that would be like a healthy thing to eat, right? It's not. It's just loaded with sugar. Yogurt is just loaded with sugar so that it's palatable and we'll eat it. Um, even, and so maybe they have um, pancakes and syrup or French toast. or I mean, there's just all kinds of things that we feed our kids and then they, they run out the door with excessive sugar. It, and it, this is a, it, literally, it's a public health disaster. For years, uh, the WIC program would give free apple juice to children. And, and that's, it's driving this whole process. It's, it's, it's just insane. I think they backed off on that, I hope. But um, I know that I, I had a colleague who years ago when he realized this, we, we both discovered this about this, we came, stumbled across this about the same time, about 15 years ago. And I remember he was working uh, at, with the health department to try to stop Wick from giving away apple juice, but he was running up against the federal government. And do you think he, he got anywhere? He, he, it was such a battle. So this is, this is a pretty complex, actually, biochemistry lesson showing you why fructose is really, really terrible for us. It's terrible for us on many, many levels. I, I would encourage you to learn other flavors. Um, when, we, when we think about food, um, if you... My, my brother lives abroad and he travels all over the world. He says the food in the United States is excessively sweet everywhere he goes. And there's a lot of places in the world that's just not nearly as sweet. And, 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 and I counsel people, learn to embrace savory or salty, even bitter, like a black cup of coffee. Can, you can learn it. It, it, you can, it can learn to be enjoyable. I had, uh, recently I was talking to a group and giving the same talk, and somebody raised their hand and they said, 
Doctor, this is a little thing. I said, doctor, what am I supposed to do? I've got a sweet tooth and I love sweet. What, what am I supposed to eat or drink? Tears. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but that's the way it feels. Now, why is it, why is it so hard? Some of this actually, in, in, it, it might be the nature of this crowd because you came to a sugar talk and you may have an, a, you know, a problem with sugar and you realize it. Uh, some of us actually have a genetic variant and that, you, that gives us the ability to taste sugar better than other people. They've named this gene, called, it's called the cookie jar gene. And literally, if, if for people who have this, and I actually had my, my, gene, my genome checked, uh, that part of it, and I actually have it, and this is actually a thing with me. Like, I cannot have one cookie. And, and if you don't have the gene, that may sound crazy to you. You may, you may hear that and go, he just has no self-control. No, I have self-control. I cannot eat one cookie. But if I have one, I don't have, I don't have the ability not to eat another one. Or M&Ms. It, it, does anyone have that experience? Like if you have an M&M, it's like next thing you know, it's like the whole package and you're looking for another package. It's called the cookie jar gene. Yeah, and, and, it's, and, and you might know if you have it. My, my wife, for example, literally, can she can have one M&M and walk away. And, I, and I'm just like, I literally cannot understand that. So be aware that if you have that, there is only one option. It's to avoid the first one. Because that's the only time you'll have any ability to do it. And it's a huge tip for a lot of people. And there is no moderation. It's like we were born to be the alcoholic of, a, of sugar. And that's, that's the thing. It's your superpower. You can taste it better than everybody else. Too bad we didn't get a better superpower. But so, so that's one thing that I would say as a tip. There's always a question when I give this talk about fake sugar. So I'm sure someone out there is wondering if they can have fake sugar. And that's, that's literally bargaining. It's, it's, it's one of the stages of grief. All right? <laughs> so as you hear this, you start, oh, can I have fake sugar at least? So fake sugar... I, it, and this is, just, this is just my opinion about it. I think it's much less bad for you than sugar. But I don't think it's good for you. I can't imagine that something that tastes sweet, for the purpose of tasting sweet, that was made in a lab by some guy with a white coat and goggles is good for you. Right? That, 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 that doesn't even sound right. So I would say, no. There's also evidence that can upset your gut flora, interrupt the gut biome, there is a definite link between diet pop consumption and obesity. And, and it's not what you would think. It's not that heavy people drink diet pop because they're heavy. It actually appears from the data that people get fat because they drink diet pop. So it's a little strange. It's a little weird. I would not recommend it. I would recommend embracing other flavors, enjoying Water, we've got the best water in the United States right here in Greeley. It's delicious. So um, there's that. Even, even, even milk doesn't cause the problem because the sugar in milk is not either glucose, there's a little glucose, but it's not fructose. It's a different kind of a sugar called lactose, and it doesn't have this same metabolic effect on our bodies. So if you can tolerate milk, it's a, definitely a better option than sugared beverages. So um, that, is, that is the extent of my talk of what I had prepared, but there's always questions. Well, let's make this interactive. What, what do we have here? What you got? What about the natural sugars you see a lot? Yeah, like great question. Honey replacement and maple yeah. Syrup and yeah, let's talk about that. So honey and maple syrup, and I have, an, I have this affection for honey. I actually used to keep bees, but it, sadly, it does have a lot of fructose in it. And I don't know of any evidence that would suggest that it's actually better for you than regular sugar. I'll, I'll just tell you anecdotally, my experience is I can't eat very much honey. But I can eat, eat an awful lot of Oreos. And I don't know why that's the case. It's like it's self-limiting. It's just so it's sickly sweet or something, and you just can't eat very much of it. But I want you to th put it in historical context. We now live in a world where people keep bees for the purpose of harvesting honey. That is a new phenomenon in the history of man. It used to be that if you wanted honey, you had to go fight bees. And if you got honey, you wouldn't want to eat it all because I'm never fighting those bees again. It was 
it was hard on you. So I, I think because I have an affection for honey, it's hard for me to like totally slam it. I would say just if you eat honey, just just barely eat it. Don't don't have very much of it because it is still it still has the fruit juice. Oh, uh, that reminds me of another natural health food sweetener that is billed as a, a, a something for diabetics, and it's called agave nectar. And, it, and people think, oh, it's agave nectar. It won't hurt my blood sugar. And it won't hurt your blood sugar because blood sugar is glucose, and agave nectar is mostly fructose. So it's actually worse for you than sugar. And, but it's billed as a health food. You'll find it in health food stores. D don't, don't eat agave nectar. It, it, it's not good for you. Don't drink a uh, fermented agave nectar either. That's not good for you. Uh, in any case, um, those, uh, did, that, did that answer your question? That seemed like there were more parts to your question. Yeah, maple syrup. Oh, so maple syrup also is another example of a naturally occurring uh, the, uh, substance that has a lot of fructose. It, it's why it tastes so sweet. Um, M monk fruit is not as it's not as bad for. Oh, let's just talk about fruit in general. Fructose is named that because there's a lot of it in fruit. Yeah, no fruit. Fruit. It's there's a lot of fruit, like apples and oranges and Bing cherries. And so the question is, can you get fat eating fruit? And the answer is yes, you can. I struggle with it every summer on on peaches and Bing cherries, but. <laughs> The, the thing is, the, th the thing is, is so moderation. It's way easier on you to eat it in its natural context because it's got fiber. It slows down the digestion. You don't get a big bolus of fructose into your blood. That doesn't turn around and cause so much fatty liver consumption. It doesn't tend to block satiety as bad. But you 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 can overeat fruit and get fat on it. it you absolutely can. Uh, so it's moderation. It's realizing this is something. This is something that was made for our consumption, and we can have it. Uh, let's not overdo it. We can, we can overeat anything. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. What, what was your question, Steve? On the, uh, the cookie jar gene, which I find intriguing. I absolutely have it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I would like to test for that. Yeah. So, so is there a possibility, or why isn't that? Just a standard test that That's a good question. You know, as, as fat people try to <laughs> that, would, that would be a great thing to yeah. have on your profile. That you, yeah. yeah. That's a great question. He said, why don't we do that as a standard test? Th those tests, when we do genetic tests, are available. Come talk to me sometime and we'll, we'll find a way to do that. Um, we had a contact who was doing that here for a while, but we can find a way to get that done for you if you, if you want to get that done. I bet you have it. If you think you have it, you, you probably do. If if really that resonates with you that you can't have what, one cookie. What you said about one cookie. Right. Can't do it. I mean, you can't do it. It's way easier to have none. It's way easier to have none. Try and have one. That's exactly right. Yeah. So th this may bring up other questions. What other questions do we have? By fasting, can you burn the fat out of your fatty liver? Oh, that is a, such a great question. It, and that thought actually occurred to me to maybe explain this. Yes, you can exhaust fat out of your liver when you fast. Here's the problem. It's not just in your liver. We've got fat everywhere. Remember what I told you? How many calories can you store up in glycogen in your liver? 1,500. Now, how many calories... This will be another guessing game. How many calories do you guys think I have on my body in the form of fat this is going to be fun, guessing it. How many do right now? How fat am I? How many calories do I have in, from a fat on my body? Who wants to go first? What did you say? You got five thousand in 25, fat. 000. Oh, twenty-five thousand. Okay. Can Any? we just do percentages? No, no. no. We want calories of fat. How many calories of fat? Ten thousand. I'm guessing you go like four months. Somebody thinks I can go six months without eating. What in the world? <laughs> Actually, we can go a long time without eating because fat is so energy dense. It has a ton of fat. Now, we've got a body composition machine back there for our patients, and we put people on, and they can monitor how they're doing. And when I put myself on there and did the math, it turns out I have about 130,000 calories of fat on my body. That is incredible. It's just, it's absolutely incredible. It means that literally, if I wasn't doing anything, once I got into starvation mode, I get 
almost lived that many days, 130 days, without eating. Probably I couldn't make it that long. That's an awful long time. You could go for three months or so, and then I mean, you'd look really bad. And it really depends on the environment, how if you had to do, you know, if you were cold or if you were too hot or whatever, there's a lot going on when it comes to those kind of situations. But I've got an enormous amount of fuel on my body. So back to the question. The question is, can you fast and burn this fat? Well, yeah. How long are you going to fast? So what we do instead of having you not eat for a month, is we go, well, intermittently, if, you will not, if you'll do intermittent fasting, and periodically go without food, after you burn the glycogen stores, you're going to be burning fat, and some of that fat will be in your liver. Some of the fat will be ever, elsewhere. But it doesn't just burn the liver fat first. Our fat is our fat, and it's all over our body, and it's going to come from where it comes. And too bad we can't make it come preferentially from the liver, because this thing called fatty liver disease is actually killing people. We're seeing some people go down with uh, liver failure because of fatty liver disease. It's a, it's a thing. It's a real big thing. So that is a fabulous question. Thanks for asking it. No, fat, it will. Fasting will. It's just really slow. And it, what it means is a lifestyle that you go and you go, you know, I think what I'm going to do is I'm, I, every week I'm going to go without food for a 24-hour period twice. If you did that, every time you went and you were going without food for 24 hours, you would start accessing and burning fat from all over your body, your liver and elsewhere. And you can turn it around. So I talk, when I talk to patients about turning the train around, it's like I tell them, look, we've got type 2 diabetes coming at you. We've got labs. You've got elevated insulin levels. And you, you prob you're probably going to get type 2 diabetes. Your sugar control isn't great. And there's a train coming down the track at you. And the name of that track, train, the name of the train, is type 2 diabetes. And we need to turn the train around. But you can't just turn a train around. It takes a long time to turn the train around. And that's when you start making some lifestyle modifications. You start doing some intermittent fasting. You stress out your liver by eating less glucose and less food in general. You start losing some weight. You start exercising. It's a long, slow process. But you can turn the train around. We've absolutely seen many people do it. Well, the, the intermittent fasting, the question was, what does it look like? And it can look like whatever you want it to look like. For some people, it's going for 18-hour blocks several times a week without food. For some people, it's going, I talked to a guy on the phone earlier today, and he was going for like a three-day fast. But that, that gets tough, let me tell you. Once you get into it, after you get to about day two or three, it's tough. But that's when you're really burning fat for fuel because you've literally got no glycogen in your body. So you can, there's a, there's a fabulous book if you want to learn more about intermittent fasting. It was written by a doctor who was a nephrologist. And he, what happened with him, his name is Jason Fung, F-U-N-G. So he, he, he was a nephrologist. And my understanding is he got, he got tired of treating as a nephrologist the end-stage ravages of type 2 diabetes. And that is people on dialysis. And that's what they do. And he's like, geez, this is so discouraging. It's all these sick people on dialysis. What if we could reel back in time and figure out a way to keep diabetes ever from happening, and that's the number one cause of kidney failure. So he has become a national advocate for type 2 diabetes, and he wrote a book called The Obesity Code. And in that book, it's all about the virtues of intermittent fasting, why it helps. And by the way, if you really kind of think about it, it kind of puts us back into that world where maybe humankind lived a couple of thousand years ago, when they did have to go through periods of famine once in a while, something that I would venture to say nobody here has ever really had to go through. So, what about yeah. So that that so the question was: Does intermittent fasting throw you into a starvation mode where you just want to store everything? And, and the answer is, if you go too long, it can affect your metabolism, and it can, it can cause a problem like that. That's why you want to do it intermittently and not for too long. And this is something that Dr. Fung in the book Obesity Code does point out. But he talks about some of the fallacies about regular dieting. And what you'll find is you can't go on a calorie restriction forever because it'll, it'll change your metabolism, and we don't want that. We want to have a healthy, robust metabolism. Another way that I've learned about intermittent fasting is to say, um, to do like 8 and 16s 
So you have an eight hour window where you eat and then 16 hours where you don't. Mm -hmm. And that really helps with not having to starve yourself for two or three days. That's right. And then you eat. Mm -hmm. So if you just do it in a, in a window and say, okay, I'm That's gonna right. eat this one, then you're not gonna eat That's, that, really that, that is absolutely one of the options that we, that we put out there with people who are interested in learning more about that. But really, sugar. It's public enemy number one. It is not a food that is meant for humans. Can you have some? Yeah, let's, let's be realistic. You can have them. Let's, let's get back to 1920s, 1900 categories of sugar consumption, and we will look like 1930s people. And you can find those, like I said, on YouTube. So I would encourage you to, to think of sugar like that. If, if I were to tell you you can never have it, you're just going to... Some of you are just going to want it more. So instead, think of this. You can have it on special occasions. Maybe it's your birthday, maybe it's Thanksgiving, and you want to have a piece of pecan pie. For goodness gracious, have a piece of pecan pie. But this business of dessert every day or sugary foods for breakfast or sugary salad dressing making, making us think we're eating healthy, uh, that, that's, that's what's got to... Um, that, that's what we got to stop if we want to go about getting healthy. So I really appreciate you guys coming in. You guys have been great. Um, and if you have any other questions, I'll stick around for a while. But thanks a lot.